Advocate Musa, for how many years were you a prosecutor in all? I was a prosecutor approximately for eight years, uh, CJ. I started as a prosecutor in the district court, and then I moved off into the regional court. And um, were you not a state uh, advocate at some stage, uh, uh, meeting a prosecutor at high court level? That is most correct, CJ. I was a state advocate from 1992 until 1995. So the total, your total prosecutorial experience amount to how many years? It would be from 1988 to 1995, which would be seven years. And uh, as a, a, a practicing advocate, practicing uh, um, uh, independently, um, counting from 1997, uh, makes it how many years? From 1997, Chief Justice, until 2015, I estimate that will be about 23 years as counsel. Yes. And um, what uh, are you doing at the moment? At the moment, CJ, uh, from 2015, uh, till presently, I have been acting uh, intermittently in the Gauteng Division and the Mpumalanga Division, uh, rendering um, services and assistance at the Pretoria, Johannesburg, and the Mpumalanga Divisions of the High Court. And while you're not acting, what do you do? Well, the truth of the matter, CJ, is that from 2015, I have been acting for a number of, of years, or weeks, shall I say, and when I'm not acting in the recesses, if I'm not called to do duty, then I'm sitting and trying to catch up with some reserve judgments. Yes, very well. Um, JP, I'm, I'm going to hand over to you, but as usual, before I do, let me just have uh, the names of colleagues who um, would want to put questions to, to the advocate. Colleagues, please. Singh. Dodov, Mbofu, Schlemmer, Tsepe. Thank you, JP. Thank you very much, uh, Chief Justice. Good morning, Advocate Musa. Uh, good morning, JP. Thank you. Um, you have in front of you the work allocations uh, depicting your work allocations since you started acting in Gauteng and in Pumalanga. Am I correct? That is correct, uh, yeah. JP. It records a total for both divisions of 168 weeks. That is correct, JP. And uh, 80 of those weeks have been in the criminal trial courts. That is most correct. Yes, 80 weeks of my acting time has been in the criminal courts and 86 weeks has been in the civil court. Yeah. And I see you've done a solid 11 weeks in opposed motions and you've done your fair share of special motions, six. So I can confidently say that of all the candidates here, applying, you've raised your hand the most in terms of assisting, including recesses. That is most correct, uh, JP. And might I just respectfully uh, point out to you that on the spreadsheet, you will in fact observe that uh, I've spent a substantial period of time also in the urgent court, yes. which is 12 weeks. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, in your view, this exposure to the High Court work. I mean, in a number of terms, you've given a full term assistance. And then, unfortunately, this would have been detrimental to your practice, I would imagine. JP, I think we have discussed this uh, previously. And I want to just say to you in all honesty, that uh, from 2015 until now, as I speak, my practice is literally non existent. Yes, because I've given my full energy and dedication 
to serving the judiciary. Yes. Um, Advocate Musa, um, I've got no further questions. I think I put the spreadsheet for the JSC to see what you've done. Um, and uh, in your view, this exposure uh, tells you you are ready and uh, able to take up a permanent appointment. Um, JP, you will recall when I came for the interview in 2019, I had 112 weeks of acting experience. And at that time, I was of the view that I was ready. But having reflected now that I've got 168 weeks of acting time, and a substantial portion of that time has been in the civil court in two divisions. In the Gauteng division, it is in Pretoria, Johannesburg, and in Pumalanga uh, division, I can unequivocally say to you that I'm satisfied with myself, that I'm more than ready, willing, and able to serve the judiciary because I think the experience I've now gained has rounded me off and polished me as a judicial officer. Thank you very much, uh, CJ. I think the MEC will deal with the, the reserve judgment issue. Thank you. Thank you, JP. Um, Honorable MEC. Uh, good morning, Chief Justice, and good morning, uh, Commissioners. Uh, I'm sorry I'm on this side of the world this morning. Uh, Apologies for any inconvenience. I think my camera is not coming out clearly, uh, Chief Justice. You don't mind if I, 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 I mute it. We, we need your voice, MEC. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, good morning, uh, Advocate Mosa. Uh, good morning, Honorable MEC. Thank you so much. I was quite thrilled when you indicated that during your spare time, you're dealing with reserve judgments. Uh, what's your attitude towards judges that delay the delivery of their judgment? Um, and how many on your side do you have? Uh, thank you, uh, Honorable MEC. I think it's, it's a given that uh, judges are expected in terms of the norms and standards as set out by the CJ to deliver judgments timelessly and to that extent, three months. So in the main, one can conclude that, that it is inexcusable for uh, judgments to be delayed. Now, having said that, Honorable MEC, I must confess at the outset that having acted in the Gauteng division, which has been regarded as I understand, the busiest high court in, the, in Africa and the busiest high court in South Africa, the volume of work is intense. And no matter whatever you try to do and your best intentions, you invariably as a judicial officer would end up with a reserve judgment. But I think having picked up a reserve judgment, it is important for one to be mindful of it and to be able to deal with these matters. And therefore I must confess that in 2017, when I was still fairly uh, new as a judicial officer, and more especially in the civil court, I uh, had a situation where I picked up a few reserve judgments. I acknowledge that in fact, um, it was not right to have those reserve judgments, but I did all that was necessary in my power to try and resolve that issue. And with the greatest of respect, I would like to point out to the members of the commission that if you take a look at my a list of judgments that have been handed down post 2017, you will observe that uh, I invariably hand down judgments within a period of two months from hearing the matter. So it was a learning experience as a judicial officer. And it is something that I think as a judicial officer one needs to, and I say this with the greatest of respect and humility, to pick up a reserve judgment so that one gets to feel what it is like 
it sits on your back day and night, week after week, and you feel a sense of accomplishment once you hand that reserve judgment down. But I think moving forward, um, Honorable MEC, I would like to give the undertaking both to my JP and to the members of the Honorable Commission that I have learned from this experience and I will ensure and endeavor that this will never be a repetition if you today find it that I am suitable to be recommended for judicial office. Thank you so much, Chief Justice. I'm covered. Thank you so much, Advocate Musa. Thank, Thank you. you Thank you so much. Honorable Singh. Thank you very much, Chief Justice. Good morning to you and fellow commissioners and admin team and Advocate Musa. I just want to follow up on the MEC uh, on, with regard to reserve judgments. At the time of uh, you completing your application, you had listed four reserve judgments. I take it that those have been delivered. And could you tell us when they were? Here. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Honorable Commissioner. Um, if you would take a look at the spreadsheet, you will see, or at the time of my application, I had indicated that uh, these judgments were outstanding. And purely on the basis that you will observe that the application was completed in November 2020, and these reserve judgments were picked up in the last week of October when I was acting in the opposed motion court. So obviously at the time when I filled the application in, these were outstanding. And if I may just assist, these judgments were handed down between the period 7 December 2020, 8 January 2020. Another one was handed down on the 24th of January and one in February. So those have been those have been dealt with. But I think while you on the on the question of reserve judgments, and if you if I might be permitted, um, I'd like to maybe I might be prejudging a question that may come to the floor. But since we're dealing with reserve judgments, I have been made aware uh, in the comments of the GCB that at uh, paragraph 9.4, page 508 that there has been a concern raised regarding reasons that were requested from myself whilst I sat in the Mpumalanga division of the High Court. Uh, and as I don't know what date this report was compiled, but I want to indicate that the matter that we are talking about at 9.4, um, that matter I dealt with on the 30th of July, 2020. I heard argument in that matter, and I delivered an extempore judgment. On the 14th of August 2020, the respondent's attorney uh, requested reasons for judgment. Um, I looked at the matter again carefully and deemed it appropriate in the circumstances that there appeared to be a, 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 a gap in, 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 in some of the documents and the evidence that was presented to me at the hearing of the matter. And I thereafter um, requested both parties in writing to supplement their heads of argument if they so desired to do so. I pause to mention that it was the applicant who in fact furnished me with additional heads on the 14th of September, 2020. And I have a copy of my reasons here, which were in fact forwarded to my secretary or clerk on the 20th of November, 2020. So for all intents and purposes, my understanding is that this particular matter was uh, finalized on the 20th of November, 2020. And I was most surprised that post 20 November, 2020, I haven't heard anything about a request for these reasons. And secondly, I, I wish to indicate that I was in Pumalanga in the Middleburg High Court in January for two weeks, and I had not heard anything about a request. So under those circumstances, I was of the firm view that my reasons had already been communicated to the, to the, to the parties. So that is the first point I'd like to deal with. 
The second point that the GCB has raised at point at paragraph 9.5. So, sorry to stop you, Advocate Musa. Uh, I, I think perhaps another commissioner may follow up on the GCB issues. Mine was just restricted to whether you delivered the reserve judgments. And I think for the record, three of those judgments would have been 2021. They're probably a slip of the tongue. You said 2020. Yes, yes. So 2021. Point. Yes. And, and then my other question I wanted to ask was from 2015 uh, to now, what have you been doing? But I think the JP has covered that. So in essence, you've been, quote unquote, full time acting on the bench in that period when you were not practicing. That is most correct. Thank you very much, uh, Advocate Musa and Chief Justice. Thank you for that question. And, and Honorable Singh, I just want to thank you, brother commissioners could do so. I'm not always sure when a commissioner considers his or her answer to have been answered satisfactorily or fully. So uh, I appreciate that you stopped the candidate when you were satisfied with the answer. It does help a great deal. Honorable Dodo. Uh, <clears throat> thank you so much, uh, uh, Chief Justice. Good morning, Advocate Mosa. Uh, good morning, Honorable Dodovo. Uh, CJ asked you a question about what are you doing currently. What I know is that you are also the chairperson of the Ethics Committee of, of the Magistrates Commission. That is most correct. Uh, yes. Now, in Parliament, we interact with the reports that you present to, to Parliament regarding the suspension of, of, of the magistrates. And in the reports, it is encapsulated serious crimes or allegations of crimes that are committed by, by the magistrates ranging from sexual assault, fraud, uh, drunk and driving, extortion and all of those. In your view, what is it that can be done to ameliorate the situation? Uh, thank you for that, uh, for that question. Yes, um, Honorable Commissioner, we have had uh, numerous interactions at Parliament, and that is correct. I sit as a, the chairperson of the Ethics Committee of the Magistrates Commission. I think um, besides obviously reaching out to judicial officers relating to the standard of ethics that is required of them. I think one of the systems that I have in fact put into place during my tenure as the chairperson was to send out a clarion call to members of the lower judiciary that the ethics committee and the ethics division and more particularly the magistrates commission in fact would have a zero tolerance approach to misconduct. And honorable member, you will, you will recall that when matters come before parliament, we would have as the ethics committee and the commission pursued these matters without fear, favor and prejudice. And we go, the, we go right to the end to ensure that justice is done and that a clear call is made out to members of the judiciary, especially the lower judiciary to indicate to them that we have a zero tolerance approach and we would go right to the end to ensure that justice is done. Thank you. All right, thank you. My second question, you have written a judgment on the case of State versus Lebohan in, in 2018. You remember that taxi driver who was kidnapping, assaulting and raping passengers. Yes. And in your judgment, you emphasized two matters regarding the sentence, that is retribution and deterrence. What is, how do they differ and which one is more important than the other, retribution and, and deterrence? If, if I may um, indicate, yes, in the matter of, it was I think the state versus Lebo Khan, and if you'll just bear with me, if I may just be allowed to, to, to deal with it, uh, look at the papers while I'm talking to you. Um, it was the, the matter where the accused person was arrested for raping women over a sustained period of time uh, on taxi journeys. 
and uh, obviously when I, and, and perhaps I might just digress before I'm able to deal with your aspect that when I apply my mind to sentencing accused persons, I'm always very mindful of the spirit of Ubuntu. And that is that one has to, since what the Constitutional Court has said in Makwanyana in 1995, that as judicial officers, we have to apply our mind to the spirit of Ubuntu, of humaneness. So on the one hand, you will deal with uh, an accused person when sentencing him with an element of humaneness, but at the same time, one needs to, one needs to impose a sentence that has the necessary effect of deterrence and retribution. So deterrence is that the sentence that you will impose must send out a clarion call to society that the courts view these matters in a very serious light and that the sentence that is imposed will obviously deter other like-minded persons from committing offenses of this nature. Now, when it comes to retribution, one must always remember that you cannot sacrifice an accused person on the altar of deterrence. You have to impose sentences that are exacting, but at the same time, your sentence that you are going to impose and that will, that will include the element of retribution, that means the, the accused must pay for his crimes, but he must not be sacrificed to the point where you approach the element of punishment as a judicial officer with a sense of anger. And I am of the respectful view that that fine balance that is called upon of a judicial officer in the sentencing process is achieved when you, in fact, apply the principles of Ubuntu. All right, thank you very much. Uh, you. You've responded. Uh, thank you, CJ. CJ, can I just make a follow up? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Honorable Dodovu. I didn't get the voice of the colleague who wants to be a follow-up. It's, it's Muimang, uh, Chief Justice. Oh, please. Please go ahead, Honorable Muimang. Uh, good morning, uh, uh, Justice. Uh, am, I, am, am I correct to, to uh, say that uh, you don't want to leave the commission with the impression that uh, the lower division of the judiciary is generally riddled with misconduct. Uh, thank you for that question. No, I, what I want, what I'm saying, uh, honorable member, is that I think in any, in any institution or any organization, you will obviously always have misconduct. And, but we as judicial officers, and in my view, are the last bastion of sanity in civil society. So Mr. Joe Public would always look to the courts and would want, to, want the courts to set a standard for what is expected of, of ethical behavior and norms and standards. So the point I'm saying and the point I'm making is that when we look at the statistics, in 2013, when I, in fact, was appointed as a commissioner to the Magistrates Commission, subsequently the chairperson, we were inundated with very high volumes of allegations of misconduct. But I'm happy to report that over the years and systematically putting checks and balances into place and sending out the clarion call to the members of the lower judiciary, that those numbers have, in fact, reduced drastically so my, my plea to you would be that what you may perhaps see in the print media or in the media generally is always not a correct re or proper reflection of exactly what's happening on the ground. Uh, so I think the long and the short of the matter is that where we are currently, I can safely say that the instances of misconduct have reduced tremendously. So it is an, an exception rather than a general rule. That is correct. Thank you, Chief Justice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Advocate of SC. Thank you so much, uh, CJ. Um, good morning, Advocate Mesa. 
Good morning, uh, Advocate Nkofu. Yes. Um, yes. Um, to save time, I'm just going to ask you my questions. I'll ask them both now and very briefly, if you can just note them. The first one is um, something you touched on that in 2019, I think when we last interviewed you, you felt that, uh, well, you felt you were ready, but the commission felt you were not ready. And I suppose like a good advocate, you accepted the outcome. So what in the 18 months since then up to now, what have you learned about yourself, about the job that have made you even more confident that you are ready now? That's the first question. The second question is, if you can just comment on the, I know you're not doing this for money, but um, on, the, on the disadvantages of being a permanent acting judge, in other words, doing the job permanently, but uh, not having the status and the benefits that come with, uh, with the, even in terms of just the respect that you would command in, in a court, in a courtroom because some people think acting judges are just people who are just here for a week or two. Um, and those kinds of disadvantages, not, 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 not confined to financial, but just general. Yes. Uh, thank you, Honorable Commissioner, for that, that question. I think I want to perhaps maybe just start with your first question and say to you that, and I share this with you absolutely honestly, Generally, you will find amongst acting judges, when you in fact start acting, after the first term, generally, you almost invariably within yourself feel that you are ready. But having acted for the number of terms that I have and the weeks that I have, I have seen the absolute wisdom of the management and more especially, I think, the judge president of this division who I think sits on the periphery, watches his acting judges, and would allocate work as you go along in order to groom you ultimately for a permanent appointment. So when I came before this commission in 2019, I had 112 weeks of acting time. I was of the view that uh, I had sufficient experience, but after the interview and having reflected now when I was completing my form, it was clear in my mind that perhaps one of the areas that could have been challenging in my recommendation would have been my experience in the civil law. I was well armed with 70 weeks in the criminal court, but I only had approximately 42 weeks in the civil court. So. In the, last, uh, from in the last 18 months, um, I have, but I think just say for 10 weeks in the criminal court, the bulk of the time have acted in the civil court where I've done, as the JP would say, heavy lifting. I've done numerous special motions. I have done uh, urgent court. And I think if, if, if I may recall, uh, Honorable Commissioner, I think you have also appeared before me on a few occasions. And yes. that then leads me, and that leads me then to the second part of your question relating to my experiences of an acting judge as opposed to a permanent judge. I am reminded of, of, of the comments during one of my conversations with the Honorable JP of our division, where he, I think, made it very clear to, to us to say, look, if you are coming to act, you are a judge and a fully fledged judge of the High Court. I think the only challenge when it comes to being an acting judge is, is the fact if you come in uh, not regularly, then you find that there's no real continuity. But in my, in my situation, sitting for such a long and a lengthy period of time, you full well begin to understand the mindset and ethos of the organization you develop and build good interpersonal relationships with the people that you work with, with your colleagues. And, and the only challenge that I found in the time that I've been acting is, is perhaps maybe on a regular basis, 
you don't sleep easily because you are concerned about security of tenure. On the one hand, you unashamedly and unreservedly have given yourself up for patriotic duty to the Republic of South Africa and act acting as a judge. But on the other hand, you also are a human being. You are a father, you are a provider, and you have other responsibilities as well. But I can safely say to you that I have weathered the storms over six years, and, and, I, and I pray that this Honorable Commission would find that the sacrifices that I've made in this time would justify me to be seriously considered for judicial appointment for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. So Jake, can I please sneak in a quick one and say yes or no answer? No, it is well. Uh, go ahead, my brother. Thank you, Chief Justice. Um, are there any pending complaints against you in respect of your work in the Magistrates Commission? Anything like that? No, I have got absolutely no complaints against me in relation to my work at the Magistrates Commission. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Justice. Thank you very much. Uh, Prof? Thank you, Chief Justice. Good morning, sir. Good morning, Professor. Please include me, CJ. I would just like to have a follow up on what Commissioner. Just make sure. Sorry, Prof. I'm sorry, Prof. Is that Honorable Malema? Yes. I'm good. Oh, thank you. Uh, sorry, Prof. Please go ahead. No problem. Um, thank you, sir. What I would like to know from you is you have indicated yourself now that the permanency of your or lack of permanency of being a uh, so called permanent acting judge has caused you trouble um, in your own mind as to where would the money come from to pr provide for your children, etc. Now, my question is, don't you think it is, in a sense, unfair to be a permanent acting judge as you have been, and also putting this commission a little bit under strain and undue influence, almost in inverted commas, by saying to us that you hope um, that we will consider your position carefully to ensure that you get a permanent position due to the fact that not having a practice, a proper practice any longer. Um, and well, for the past six years, having to wait upon receiving an appointment, do you think that is the way in which the judiciary should be going, having these type of appointments? Thank you for that question, uh, Professor. I think I, I, I'd like to perhaps maybe respond by firstly saying to you that when you are called, when you're invited to act as an acting judge, there are no expectations placed to you to say that if you come and if you are invited to come and act in the division, that you in fact will will somehow the other somewhere in the future uh, be eligible for an, for for a permanent appointment. So I think perhaps maybe uh, I may be misunderstood. When I, when I indicated what I did, uh, I in no way, with the greatest of respect, am applying any type of pressure upon this honorable commission on the basis that I've been acting for a period of time. I, 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 my request simply is that this commission seriously consider my application on the merits of itself, on the merits of my work, on the merits of my experience. But I believe that it will not be fair and correct to put into the, uh, on, onto the scales the fact that someone has acted for a lengthy period of time, that there is this expectation that one must then be appointed. I think the JP makes it very, very clear at all material times when you are invited that there's no real expectation. Um, some people get appointed in a year. Some people get appointed in two years. And that is all depends upon the management who will then decide as to when that particular acting judge is sufficiently rounded and ready to in fact make himself available for permanent appointment. Thank you, sir. Um, that clarifies your position to me. Um, I would just like to have another question and that is what is your judicial philosophy? Yes, thank you. Thank you for that uh, question, Professor. Um, my judicial philosophy, very simply, um, is between two norms that I'd normally like to apply my mind to. And that is one is that I, I subscribe to what we may call a liberal 
judicial philosophy as well as a moderate judicial philosophy, which ultimately I would apply when I deal with matters, when I having due regard to the rule of law, as well as the rights in, enshrined in the constitution. But the important thing about it is that the, this, this part of where I apply my mind in terms of the rule of law, as well as the rights enshrined in the constitution, these are underpinned simply by the, by the maxim of Ubuntu. So in every single matter that I deal with, be it criminal, be it civil matters, be it evictions, my judicial philosophy is always underpinned by the spirit of Ubuntu. It is simple, it, 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 it's difficult to define it, but it's about humaneness. It's about a whole. It's about, I am because we are. And that, that comes through with the greatest respect when you read my judgments. You will find that although I stand by the principles of stare decisis et coetua non movere, I am I'm mindful of the litigants who are before me, but I stick to the principles of the law and I dispense justice accordingly. So I, I believe that is very, very important. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Chief Justice. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Prof. Uh, Commissioner Tsepe. Thank you, CJ. I'm covered. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Honorable Malema. Uh, thank you, CJ. There was a matter uh, of uh, uh, Faisal versus SARS of the airport which was heard uh, on the 24th of July, 2017, and judgment was given on the 20th of July, 2018. Took the whole year. What really happened? Yes. Thank you for that, uh, Honorable Commissioner. Um, that was a matter where the applicant came before me to bring an application to have the money returned uh, that was seized by the South African Revenue Services. It was a large amount of money. I think it was, if I may stand to be corrected, but it was a, a, a large amount, a couple of million rand. And I had heard argument in the matter. The arguments were very, very complex, required me to reflect on the prevailing law relating to this specific aspect. And as I worked on the judgment, it became necessary for me to engage the parties relating to one or two aspects uh, in respect of this particular matter. And the one difficulty and challenge that I had was an unanswered question from both the parties relating to the, to the, to the central thrust of the argument raised by the applicant is at the time when he was found with a substantial amount of unaccounted for cash, he alleged that he was in an area called as no man's land. And it was almost near impossible and difficult for me sitting as a judge to be able to, to come to a conclusion relating to that. And subsequently, I then engaged the South African Revenue Services at the OR Tambo Airport. I requested that I be allowed an inspection in loco I then conducted an inspection in loco and I was fortunate enough that by conducting that inspection in loco, the answers that I sought in writing that particular judgment had become very, very clear to me. And subsequently I was able to pen that judgment where I found that the applicant, I dismissed the case of the applicant. The money was forfeited to the state. And that is the, the reason it took such a lengthy period of time because the red tape in order to get permission to be able to go into the specific area where these monies are kept, where monies are confiscated, are generally not open for the public to view. So that was the, the delay, and it was a rather technical argument that was raised in this particular matter. But having penned that judgment, I, I would like to perhaps maybe just give you ease, Honorable Commissioner, that that judgment I'm given to understand is used regularly by the South African Revenue Services 
to be able to defend their position relating to these particular money laundering matters. So I touched on earlier and said that I have learned from these experiences. And if I may say, if you look at my spreadsheet, you will find that in 2017, I was newly uh, uh, invited to act in the civil court. And these were technical matters, difficult matters. A huge consideration was placed upon me because a large amount of money was involved. And I had to be very particularly careful when I penned the judgment that I was not going to create a dangerous precedent. That if I had found that in fact the applicant was correct in the allegation, that would have opened up the floodgates to what we are trying to avoid. So that, is, that in long and short, honorable commissioner is my answer for the delay. Judge, are you saying to this commission and to me and to the whole country that the arguments gets closed on the 31st of July for you to have access to whatever access at the airport. It takes you the whole year. And you want me to come and accept that you took the whole judge. There's no institution in the whole of South Africa that can stop a judge from coming to do an inspection in loco when there is a matter before them worse. When SARS is part to it, SARS has got access to the airport. Uh, so was this a, an agent application because the information I have is that you you took the whole year to give a judgment on an agent application I, I, I concede that honorable commissioner but having conceded that I want to just respectfully say that it was a matter with, with, with numerous technical issues technical arguments were raised relating to this particular matter which re, 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 which required me to introspect, circumspect, and to be able to, to apply my mind properly there too. And having said that, I want to give you the comfort uh, that I accept unreservedly that yes, I was quite incorrect uh, upon reflecting that it took longer than anticipated. And I have learned from that particular experience, as you will observe from my spreadsheet, that after that, I've never made myself guilty ever of delaying any of my judgments. Thank you, CG. Thank you, Honorable Commissioner. Thank you, thank you, Honorable Malema. Uh, Advocate Musa, thank you very much, sir. You, you are excused. Thank you, Honorable CJ. Thank you, thank Honorable you. JP and members of the commission. Thank you, sir.